Hello, and welcome to uh, Insurrection with Brenton Lengel, um, formerly carried on the Starcom Radio Network, now carried on my YouTube channel because uh, I decided to do that. <laughs> and I am uh, joined with my longtime friend, uh, Caleb Maupin. Caleb, how are you doing? I'm great. How about yourself? I'm terrific. It's been a great couple of days. The channel just surpassed um, 1,000 subscribers, which was my goal. I, I wanted to get it done before the end of August, but by mi before mid-September, that's that's close enough. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So we've grown really quickly. Um, I have you and a couple of other people really to thank for that. So thank you, Caleb, um, and thanks to to you know your uh, followers who've also gotten interested in the content that I'm putting out. Um, and I just finished a debate with Milton Friedman, uh, or I'm sorry, Milton Friedman's son, David D. Friedman, which went really well. Uh, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to watch that yet or not. I haven't had the chance yet. No. Okay, we, we if you do get the chance, we should totally watch it and talk about it because it was probably the I fought the final boss of anarcho capitalism. <laughs> right. Well, he's famous. I know Milton Friedman's son is very famous for being an anarcho capitalist, right? Mm -hmm. he's, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's one of first he's to use the term or say what? Is he the first to use the term? Uh, no, no, that would be Murray Rothbard. Um, uh, okay. But I would say he's the probably the smartest anarcho capitalist out there. Um, and he's unique in that he makes a consequentialist case for anarcho capitalism, whereas most ANCAPs are very like uh, deontological focused, where they'll essentially try to come up with r rules and try to run society on sort of a moralistic notion of uh, non-aggression as opposed to, you know, really kind of digging into is anarcho-capitalism actually a good way to run things. Um, but, you know, that's uh, that's not the topic of today's stream. So we can definitely do that in the future. Um, right. uh, what I wanted to talk with you about, and this is an important one for me to talk with a, with a Marxist about, because I want to talk with you about one of my personal heroes, uh, Buenaventura de Rudy. Uh, Longtime viewers of my channel will notice that uh, this particular book is actually what my gargoyle um, sits on in, in the background in most of my things. And this is one of uh, the this this particular biography of Derudi, and it, it is ginormous. This is by Abel Paz. Uh, Abel Paz was actually he was 15 when uh, the Spanish Revolution uh, and the Spanish Civil War happened. And he fought like with the anarchists as a child, um, uh, wound up having to eventually flee Spain when the fascists won and returned in 1942 to fight against Franco as a guerrilla. Um, he wound up being in prison for quite a while for his uh, anti-fascist activities. Um, and um, he is uh, frankly a fascinating historian. So, you know, when I first got interested in anarchism, I mean, it was really revolutionary Spain that drew, drew my attention. Uh, there was something really compelling about the Spanish anarchists um, and about the, the circumstances surrounding the Spanish Civil War. Um, and the first uh, source that I sort of turned to was George Orwell. Um, because he fought with the Poom, and I've been doing a, a series uh, on homage to Catalonia with Bobby of the Mustache Bob, uh, Mustache Mafia podcast, uh, talking about that uh, in, in sort of a long form. Um, and you can't really read Orwell, uh, and you can't read about the Spanish Civil War without hearing the name Derudi. Uh, specifically Buenaventura de Rudy, who is, uh, in my estimation, he is essentially the uh, anarchist Che Guevara. Um, and it's important to me to also read this with a Marxist, because interestingly enough, de Rudy and the de Rudy column uh, and uh, like a lot of uh, his, his anarchist contemporaries, like... Um, uh, Francisco Escaso uh, uh, and uh, Oliver were actually accused of being Bolsheviks or having their anarchism more like Bolshevism. Uh, that was sort of the, the further left critique of who they were and what they did. So I thought that this would be just an interesting historical figure to talk about, uh, about his life and eventual death, uh, and to get your impression on it. So um, are you ready to dig in? Sure. All right, amazing. And like, as you guys can see, we will not be able to go over everything in Derudi because like this book that I have here as I was doing it for my, like this is ginormous and like I have it like marked and highlighted like throughout 
the entire thing, uh, largely because I, as I said, I was doing this as research first for a play and then a screenplay that I wrote about the life of Buena Ventura de Rudy. So uh, Buena Ventura de Rudy was born to a socialist family. Um, his father identified as a libertarian socialist. Um, and one of the first things was, was that he was um, apprenticed to a, uh, a mechanic and blacksmith. Uh, named Melkor Martinez that taught Derudi um, like how to uh, like literally like medieval style blacksmithing um, because, you know, fascinatingly enough, um, the Spanish civil war sort of existed at this time where Spain was in a period of transition where aspects of feudalism were still there. The Latifundian system, uh, where there were large landowners who essentially ruled like nobles and, um, you know, the most of Spain was like agrarian peasants. But then they were also moving into the, uh, span like they were moving into the modern mechanized era. So it was this era of uh, very strong contradictions within like where technology was, but also where Spain was politically, socially, technologically. Uh, and so he was first trained as a blacksmith. Uh, and one of the uh, things, one of the first lessons that Melchor Martinez um, imparted on the young Derudi was, was that um, you had, it, it didn't just take strength to shape the steel. Um, you actually had to have intelligence and patience and you had to wait until the steel was red hot to, and direct your blows carefully and only then will it take the form that you want. Um, Melkor also famously said, essentially when Derudi's parents took him to um, Melkor, he said, I will teach your son to uh, be a master blacksmith, uh, but I will also teach him to be a socialist. And uh, this sat well with the family and also with young Derudi. Derudi was incredibly intelligent. Uh, he was big for his age. Um, and uh, his mother actually wanted him to be uh, essentially a scholar. They, they, but uh, Derudi insisted that he be a worker like his father. Um, and so from a very young age, he's being trained by, you know, this mentor. And um, the first time that He's 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 raised very much in like a revolutionary um, climate because Spain around this time is they're being utterly torn apart by war in Morocco um, as Spain tries to hold on to its colonies. And one of the big things is that like Derudi talks in his memoirs, he says specifically, like in a letter to his sister, um, Rosa, since my most tender age, the first thing I saw around me was suffering, not only in our family, but also among our neighbors. Intuitively, I had already become a rebel. I think my fate was determined then. Um, and, and this is very much, he, he goes on to talk, I use a line in the, the screenplay that I'm writing about Derudi, and I use a lot of his actual words, um, that he remembers his uh, grandfather punching his legs, because the grandfather had uh, caught polio or something similar to that in anger, as uh, his sons, as, as his grandchildren were like sent off to war in Morocco, while the rich Spaniards bought workers' sons to take their own children's place. So we really see like a high level of class antagonism between the Spanish ruling class and the workers themselves. And this comes to a head with Derudi when um, he is part of a miners strike that goes on in which Francisco Franco, uh, the uh, eventual you know, fascist dictator of Spain, um, was deployed against the striking miners and they used machine guns on them and killed uh, dozens of people, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and this was something that Derudi encountered very, very young. So it does seem like right off the bat, like he is being set up as a, as a smart, exceptional child from the very beginning uh, who is interested in socialism, interested in, and possesses a great deal of class loyalty um, to uh, kind of be set up for the life of a revolutionary. I mean, it, all of the the material conditions around Spain seem to be pushing him in that direction. Now, I know you've read a lot about revolutionary figures. Does this uh, does this history sound familiar to you? As a, 
or, or does Derudi seem to more stick out in comparison to other uh, major revolutionary figures? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that Spain is in a different phase of historical development than most of Europe because of the Spanish Inquisition. While the rest of Europe had been having the Reformation, in Spain, uh, they had, you know, the Catholic Church had remained intact and they had ruthlessly crushed uh, any reforming progressive scientific elements. Um, and the Spanish Inquisition was very, very ugly and that the consequences of that were long lasting and that, um, you know, that, that the Reformation was really the beginning of the overturning of feudalism in Europe, right? With, the, mm -hmm. with, with Martin Luther, with, with everything that went on with, in Switzerland, uh, and among the, the, Swiss, the Swiss people with um, Ulrich Zwingli. And uh, it all, you know, it all kind of opened that and Spain never went through the Reformation. The Catholic Church kept its grip on Spain. And so feudalism was much, you know, more thoroughly intact. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, the guilds, right? You talk about blacksmiths. Um, the guilds were a big part of feudalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, um, you know, in, in feudalism, you still need somebody to make the, the knight's armor. Right. You still need somebody to, you know, to work metal, even though it's largely an agrarian economy and that these guilds were kind of essential in the feudal order. And that part of what kept the Dark Ages going for so long with, with so little technological progress was that a lot of these guilds had a rule that you could not improve technology, that the, that the craft could not be changed. Right. That the way you must keep doing it that way. Hmm. Um, and that the Renaissance, part of the Renaissance was the breakthrough where they started changing those rules in the guild. So you could make steel more efficiently and you could, you know, do things, do things that guilds did uh, in a more efficient manner. And I think that's particularly interesting. Yeah. What I, I, I can't help but point out that, um, you know, the, who else was the son of a socialist blacksmith that was none other than Benito Mussolini. Right. Really? Yes. Benito Mussolini's father was also a socialist and also a blacksmith. So uh, but but that's a that was a skilled trade back then. Right. Mm -hmm. You were not a peasant on the land. You were not an aristocrat. You were a, a craftsman. You were a, a worker. And there were very few people that did that. But it was a very good position to be in. Uh, you had job security your whole life. Right. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there was no danger of starving to death. They were always going to need somebody to do it. And the guild would make sure that that your job was protected. They would never let, you know, another blacksmith starve. So it, it's not like like it is now where it's just, you know, like a plumber goes out, he gets work. He doesn't get work. It wasn't like that at all. It was he was always working. Um, and that's that's something to think about. And that, um, that in a way, you could almost argue that's the middle class in feudalism. Right. The ruling class is the aristocracy, the peasantry yeah. and the craftsmen are kind of the middle class of feudalism. Um, and and uh, so that's that's kind of interesting that he played that role. And yeah, uh, well, and, and also the fact that uh, you can see the middle class values in a lot of middle class, you know, social climbers. And you can see his mother wanting him to move up from the middle class to, to being a scholar. And I honestly think with as brilliant as Derudi was, I think he would have made an incredible scholar. But also, I don't think he would have been happy in that role. I think when he, because we'll find out more about him as we go forward. But well, he would you know, have had to know mathematics to be a blacksmith, right? He would have been mm -hmm. able to how to yeah. measure things and, and he would have to have do, do calculations in order to do that job. So he would have had to have been more educated than the average person was just in order to do that job. You don't think of that. You think of that as being a manual labor kind of job, but compared mm -hmm. to the average peasant, he had to be able to take out and measure pieces of metal. He had to measure temperature probably and get things hot. Like he, he had a, a level of education that was not, you know, normal for the average person in a semi-feudal society. Absolutely. Um, now uh, he joined a, the he joined a number of unions uh, very quickly and became uh, active in the CNT. Um, and uh, he observed with uh, some pleasure that he was able to agitate the union leaders. Who's actually pissing off like the older union leaders that were with him, uh, who criticized him for his revolutionary uh, insistence. They urged him to be more patient, but Derudi responded by saying that socialism is either active or it isn't socialism. Um, and that's something that's like very big with Derudi. He, he's very much a person who walks the walk. Um, I also get the impression about Derudi that as he, um, like the way people talk about him, and not just Abel Paz, but the other sources that I've I've looked into that have talked about him. He, he's a man of like boundless energy when everybody else is like passing out. He's up and he's like, go, 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 go. Um, I sometimes wonder if he might have been a, uh, a uh, manic depressive uh, personality type um, because the, just the constant boundless energy that they have and also crossed with uh, the fact that like, 
he was in this incredibly dark time. Um, and oftentimes people who suffer from depression uh, tend to have a more accurate picture of actually what's going on than necessarily neurotypical people. For instance, um, Abraham Lincoln uh, was known to suffer from major depression. And um, uh, there's a lot of histor historical scholars who say that Abraham Lincoln may not have been able to lead the country through the American Civil War had he not um, been experienced with dealing with these incredibly dire circumstances every day because of just the, the way his brain processed the world. Hmm. Um, you know, it just, it, it's, it's just an interesting aspect of it. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, the troops were called out. Um, they used a uh, machine gun and then said um, it, this was the 1917 general strike. Uh, the revolt was revolutionary, unanimous, and complete throughout Spain. I don't know if anything like it had occurred elsewhere in the world. Hundreds of workers fell through the peninsula, but it began without a concrete goal, kind of like Occupy Wall Street, and lasted a week. Uh, the her heroic workers of the Austrians prolonged it for eight additional days, um, and the repression was severe. Troops were called out, and they used their machine guns against the strikers. The troops were thought to have behaved bar barbarously in the arm. Uh, the armory with the king was the only real power in the country at the time. Um, and we've seen this a lot. I mean, there was like, you think about the, the Blair Mountain, the, the Battle of Blair Mountain um, uh, uh, in, in America when like, in like they literally dropped bombs on striking workers. Um, you, there, I, there was the, the thing that happened in South Africa where troops fired on striking miners. This is a, a, a something that has played out multiple times in recent history. Um, yeah. Well, I, I know there was a famous American mine owner. I don't remember which one who said you can't operate a coal mine without machine guns. Uh, that's the quote. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I think it was, a, it was the same coal miner that also said he could hire half the working class to shoot the other half. Um, and it's a uh, particularly, you know, I mean, that was that happened, right? That these coal miners would go out on strike and then they would get shot at. That's big Bill Haywood. Uh, that's just the history. I mean, going back for thousands of years and, and miners were known for being rather militant. But they were also known for facing some of the harshest conditions. I mean, mining coal, even today with all our technology is a really dangerous job. And it's a really, really uh, not fun job. You know, I mean, it's very hot down in the mines and and it's it's you know, and we we continue to hear. I mean, how many coal accidents are there that we hear about? Um, you know, I mean, you know, you turn on the news and, you know, there's like five coal miners are missing and they are able to rescue one, able to rescue another. I mean, even today, it's very dangerous. Imagine how what it was like before the technology and, and before yeah. safety regulations and such. So and even then, you know, you, and then you get stuff like black lung. That was a huge issue. So um what wound up happening was, was that Spain was in a, a huge amount of turmoil um, and it, they had already lived through one fascist dictatorship, um, that of um, uh, Primo de Rivera. So in uh, 1922, inspired by Mussolini, uh, King Alphonse the 13th of Spain thought he could solve the country's problems by imposing another fascist general who would he, who would um, subdue the country and permit him to reign in peace. So he went to a guy by the name of Sanchez Guerrera uh, and basically said, I'm going to make you the new prime minister of Spain. And, you know, you're going to be the new fascist dictator and I'll just get to be king and continue to, you know, just live the lifestyle that I have grown accustomed to. Um, but the interesting thing about this was that as soon as the power was handed over to Sanchez, um, he actually formed the government uh, uh, of a social truce and uh, reestablished constitutional guarantees in 1922. So he pulled sort of a Smedley Butler. We saw this in the United States when uh, Roosevelt did the New Deal. A number of families Families, a number of very rich, influential families came to General Smedley Butler and said, we want you to rule. Uh, we'll keep uh, FDR on as a figurehead and you'll be the new fascist general that runs the new fascist USA. And Smedley Butler went, uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Hang on for just a second. And then went straight to Congress and was like, hey, they wanted me to take over the country. What are you guys going to do about it? And of course, <laughs> because it's America, and in America, rich people do not go to jail. Um, the congressional inquiry uh, determined that, in fact, this was a real plot. 
that they were attempting to overthrow the United States government and make the United States a fascist nation. Um, but no one was punished. No one went to jail. Everyone got away with it. And uh, they just sort of forgot that it happened. And the media downplayed it. The New York Times said it wasn't real. or It was like, it was weird. It was on the congressional record. The congressional investigation determined it was real, but somehow the media gave the impression this was all just a rumor or something. It was very strange. You read the press reports about it. It's very, very strange the way it was covered in American media. It was almost like they didn't, they feared too much alarm or something. They mm -hmm. just, they didn't want there to be, they didn't want to further the unrest. I understand the American Legion was supposed to be involved in that, right? It was supposed to be the American Legion that would that would go. Yeah, uh, well, it was the, the so there was a bonus army at the time. Basically, um, there were soldiers that uh, had come back and they were owed a bonus uh, that was never paid. That wasn't being paid by the government. Um, so they were owed all this money and they actually were doing their own kind of Occupy Wall Street where they went and camped out like in, in parks. Uh, I believe this was in uh, Washington, D.C. And basically said it was led by the yeah. Communist Party. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so with regard to Smedley Butler, what the rich people were hoping was that he would lead this bonus army to take over the country because these soldiers were obviously one trained to fight and two like uh, dissatisfied. So and, and Smedley was well liked among them. It's very interesting that they you know, didn't understand communism and socialism that much that they thought that the soldiers would just jump up and be fascist. And they thought that Smedley Butler would be down with being a fascist. It, it makes me wonder like if they just thought he could be bought or if they just were completely politically illiterate. Well, I mean, 1931 is when the famous bonus army incident took place. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that was this this huge gathering. And I believe Abraham Lincoln's grandson was one of the leaders of it. Um, and the Communist Party was involved, but they were occupying the National Mall with their tents. And then it was forcibly cleared and four people died and it was very mm -hmm. ugly. But the business plot wasn't until 1933. So perhaps the idea was that that they would call another bonus demonstration, this time led mm -hmm. by fascist sympathizers. Um, a lot of times, though, when you have coups, you have demonstrations that are taking place, but then you also have sections of the, the actual live military that take action under the under the chaos created by demonstrations. So it could have been that they were going to maybe manipulate some kind of left wing demonstration to happen in the Capitol and all of that. And then under the cover of that, the military would would move in and seize the government. Um, yeah, that, that happens. Absolutely. Uh, it also may have been that I'm, I'm misremembering it and that he became famous through the bonus army. And then wow. that's why what attracted them to him. Um, but either way, um, I'm going to jump back to Spain. Sure. And sure. Uh, as I said before, Derudi um, oftentimes was accused of being more Bolshevik like in his approach to anarchism. Um, and so I wanted to read this part here. Um, Derudi's view of the anarchist role and uh, the professional revolutionaries were was the complete opposite. Um, uh, th this uh, between um, it was the complete opposite of um, uh, another friend of his, uh, Francisco. For him, the proletariat was the real leader of the revolution, and if anarchists had a significant impact, it was only because of their radicalism. The great theorists, he argued, uh, drew their ideas from the proletariat, which is rebellious by necessity and given its condition as an exploited, uh, exploited class. Above all, the struggle should rest on the uh, solidarity and militants must recognize that the proletariat has already found the vehicle for its liberation by itself through the Federation workshop and the, fa uh, and the factory groups. For Buenaventura, they would only adulterate, uh, adulterate the proletariat's ma uh, maturation if they turned themselves into, quote, professional revolutionaries. What anarchists had to do was understand the natural process of rebellion and not separate themselves from the working class under the pretext of serving it better. That would only be a prelude to a betrayal of the bureaucratization and a new form of domination. So that at least is, is Derudi's view on revolutionary politics. And it's interesting because it seems like he is kind of rejecting the idea of a, um, I guess, a uh, what's it called? Um, a vanguard party necessarily. But at the same time, he, because of his emphasis on action, he is and his friends are essentially acting 
as a vanguard party in a number of times, which led to the accusation that they were Bolsheviks. Now, what's your thought of that in, in terms of like revolutionary theory? How does that fit in? Well, a couple things. Uh, first of all, his focus on the proletariat um, is certainly more Marxist um, and that uh, in this era, it seemed like anarchists were more identified with the peasantry um, mm -hmm. and the liberation of the peasantry. So, you know, he, I mean, he comes out of the, You mentioned the CNA, which was a syndicalist organization. Yeah, the CNT. Right? Yeah, the CNT, right? And so it was, you know, it was about labor unions, but rejecting political action. You know, the idea being that direct action on the job is the focus. We're not going to try to build a Marxist party to seize the state. We're going to try mm -hmm. to have the workers seize their factories. That was the syndicalist movement. Uh, in Spanish, the word for labor union is sindicato. Um, and mm -hmm. syndicalism and anarcho-syndicalism is, is, is the movement for labor unions, basically. Um, and uh, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, it seems like he very much believes in spontaneity. And mm -hmm. in Lenin's book, What is to be Done, which is considered like it's, it's the, the book where he lays out the vision for building the Bolshevik party, he argues against spontaneity. He says, left to its own devices, uh, the working class is only capable of developing a trade union consciousness, that you need a vanguard party to make the proletariat capable of seizing power. Um, they can't do it spontaneously. Um, and I believe many anarchists disagree with that, consider that to be a very elitist statement. They believe the working class is capable of spontaneously moving toward toward revolutionary ideas. Yeah. Is that accurate? I think that's very accurate. And I, I think it goes to show the usually the difference in temperament between uh, a person, a socialist who expresses their uh, socialistic values uh, from a, a more anarchistic temperament and one uh, who goes from a more Marxist temperament. Um, because I think in a lot of ways, I, you and I talked and we mentioned that the big difference in socialism is, is almost one of emphasis. Mm -hmm. Like they're not super different, but like it, it's what they choose to emphasize at, at certain times that really seems to set them apart into different parties. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. And the goal is obviously the same, a stateless, classless world. The question is just how to get there. Yeah, I would I would agree entirely. Now, um, Daruti's best friend, uh, a guy by the name of Ascaso, um, he and Daruti, uh, like they had a vigorous friendship um, and they were active collaborators. They were both anarchists and he they would form two out of the, the three of like Daruti's big, like three people anarchist group. Um, now, this is going to kind of fly in the face of my characterization, characterization of Daruti as possibly manic depressive. Because um, it says, Ascaso was thin and high strung. Daruti was athletic and calm. The former was suspicious and seemed unpleasant at first. The latter was extraordinarily friendly. Cold calcula uh, calculation, rationality, and skepticism were characteristics of Ascaso. Daruti was passionate and optimistic. Daruti fully gave himself over to the friendship from the start, while Escasso was reserved until he got to know people better. These two revolutionaries forged a deep trust and, a, and great projects grew from the dialogue between them. Now, I really like this characterization of the two of them because it shows, in, in my opinion, two people who are very, very different um, who were still united in a goal where they kind of balance each other like yin and yang. Um, do, do, have you seen uh, dynamics like that in other revolutionary leaders and their closest friends? Can you think of any? No, actually, I, I, I mean, I feel like friendships often develop that way, right? People learn to kind of dance, right? And it takes people a while working together, like you and I, right? I mean, we've learned, yeah. we've done so many of these streams, we know how to bounce off each other after a while. And that's just kind of how working relationships, friendships, uh, political relationships tend to work is that you kind of learn, you know, at first when you dance with somebody, someone's going to step on somebody's feet. It's a little bit <laughs> awkward, but after you had a dance partner for a while, you know exactly what the other person's going to do and, and you, you learn to do it. And that kind of rhythm is very essential. And when you can get political organizations where you have that, there's kind of a division of labor that develops and everyone kind of is able to play off each other and everyone's strengths is able to come forward. That's kind of the, the magical the magical success formula, right? Um, but the question is, are you able to actually do that? Because rivalries happen. Now, it's interesting. I, I recently saw that there's a new book that's been published called The Guru Papers. Um, and it mm -hmm. talked about the development of political cults and political organizations. And it talked about how there's actually two stages. Um, there's the stage of ascendancy, when the group is new and getting a lot of things done and expanding. And things tend to work very, very well in that period. But the problems in revolutionary organizations and sent, tend to set in after things are not expanding anymore, right? After after the group, you know, the, the recruitment has leveled out uh, 
and that you can even look at the Soviet Union, right? When the Soviet Union was was new and revolutionary, it was much more vibrant. There were much more factions. But then some of the more authoritarian stuff happened after you know after things tampered down. And that that often you know when when groups are in a group period of expansion, when there's a lot of people in the streets protesting and stuff, revolutionary organizations function a lot better. People are just happier. But it's when you get into a darker period that the clashes happen. And sometimes it's the moment that makes those relationships more than anything. When people really see a reward and, and a definite outcome of what they're doing, uh, when it feels like they can really accomplish something, all of a sudden people work together better. People can get things done. People's strengths show up. People are not competing with one another. It's not like a competition um, and everyone can just kind of do what they want to do. But then when, when you enter a period where you're not seeing any success, that's when people kind of turn on each other and you get a lot of factionalism and disagreement. It, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it was, uh, oh, geez, who was it? Was it Truman? Not Truman. Um, Wilson. Woodrow Wilson said that uh, he had a harder time being the uh, president of Yale um, <laughs> than, than he did being the president of the United States. That's awful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's like when, when the stakes are lower, people do seem to get more factionalized. And when thing like when the shit hits the fan, people tend, you, you can often see some of the best and, and worst in human nature come out. Um, so this, um, and this goes back to, uh, so Derudi in this period here prior to, uh, the revolution, when he gets like really, really big, um, it, it, it's noted that like Derudi had a dynamic temperament and there was nothing more contrary to his nature than idleness. Inactivity was torturous for him. And when the circumstances forced it upon him, he tried to release his energy in a thousand different ways. Um, so a, a good example of this, and I think is kind of funny, but it gives you an insight into his character, um, is that, uh, when he arrived in Madrid, he discovered that the conference he had, uh, to attend had been postponed for a week and this disrupted his plans. Uh, this was an anarchist radical conference. He was going to, uh, but he took advantage of this time to accomplish part of his mission, uh, by visiting a friend of his whom he had sorted out, uh, the medal for, uh, who he had to sort out a matter of the trial noted above. So there was a trial that was going on at the time. His friend, uh, Buena Casa, didn't recognize him at first. Derudi was going around dressed like an Englishman, disfiguring his face with some thick framed glasses. Derudi asked him about the status of the trial and delivered some money for legal costs. He then said he wanted to go see the inmates. Boyanesca did everything he could to dissuade Derudi, saying that it was too risky uh, and a good way to get himself locked up because Derudi at this time was already wanted. Um, I, I believe um, for an attack uh, that took the life of one of um, the uh, archbishops uh, of Zaragoza, actually. Uh, and we'll go into that in just a minute. Uh, but Derudi would not be deterred while he's running around in this like Groucho Marx disguise. <laughs> um, a visit, he said, would raise the prisoner's morale. And uh, his friend finally acceded, hoping that the jailers would take him for some strange tourist, uh, given his foreign outfit. Um, now, um, Derudi actually did manage to go to the prison dressed as an Englishman. He did manage to talk and the jailers were just like, who the hell is this weirdo? Okay, whatever. Um, so he was actually totally right. Um, but uh, what wound up happening was, was that after uh, his trip to the prison, the police surprised Derudi from behind while he was walking on a Kala street. Uh, he considered resisting, but realized he was completely surrounded. They promptly threw him in a car and shot off towards police headquarters. They confirmed his identity at the police station and charged him with three crimes. One, the armed robbery of a traitor uh, from San Sebastian, the plot to kill uh, Alphonse the 13th, the, the king of uh, Spain, and desertion from the army. Um, which he had been uh, conscripted into the army and had deserted for obvious reasons. Uh, the newspapers in, Mad in Madrid and Barcelona raved about Derudi's detention, declaring him one of Spain's leading terrorists and, the, uh, and cheering that he had finally been captured. Indeed, the crime report makes him out to be an extraordinary figure. They described him as a consummate bank robber, train bandit, and dangerous terrorist, and above all, an unbalanced mind with the signs of a born criminal, a perfect example of what the criminologist Lombarso, uh, Lombarso advanced uh, in his outrageous study on anarchists. Now, I'm not familiar with Lombarso exactly, but I am familiar with kind of like this sort of criminology background. So what's important to understand about Derudi during this period um, 
right up to his capture here is that he has been sort of almost an Osama bin Laden figure to um, the Spanish upper class. Um, he carried out the attack on the motorcade that claimed the life of the Archbishop of Zaragoza. He attempted to attack uh, the King's motorcade um, and he um, uh, also was responsible for a number of uh, crimes uh, and bank robberies and heists, all of which were being used to fund the revolution. So, um, you know, he's already on the wrong side of the law here, and it seems like everybody, aside from those who know him, are, are very much against him. Now, does this sound, so is there anything, because I know Stalin was a bank robber in his youth, but, but, but beyond Stalin, like, is this a common story for revolutionary people during these periods? Well, until now, I, I didn't realize that he had been organizing in an underground clandestine manner. Um, now, I'm curious, is this simply because he engaged in these these acts of violence, these bank robberies, this assassination plots? Or was it simply that one could not did you, there was there no freedom of speech in Spain at this time? Could one legally organize for socialism mm -hmm. or uh, or not? Uh, I'm under the impression that one could not. Spain okay. had some incredibly re restrictive laws. Spain at this time was like women were not allowed to go out unaccompanied by men. It was like Saudi Arabia, mm. you know. Okay. Um, so Spain had some pretty, um, pretty nasty laws. Now, also due to, to this um, with Derudi, I mean, like this is the time of uh, Pistellarismoism. And um, you, anybody who's listening to this can look this up. Like, what's really important to understand about this period in Spanish history is that um, this is the, the the level of class antagonism is something that we in the first world don't really see today and don't understand. Um, so there were company unions, yellow unions, that the bosses in Spain would force um, people to join. So it would be a union set up by the boss and the whole purpose of this union was to prevent strikes. And not only that, but the union itself was full of people who weren't actually workers, but were in fact assassins that were hired. And what they would do is they would listen in on the other meetings with the workers or if anybody came up to them and talked to them about the possibility of striking or taking any kind of action against the boss, they'd take him out back and shoot him in the head. Um, so like, that's how th this is, imagine just, just imagine for a second, having that relationship with your employer and with your fellow workers that like, if you, you're a worker at Amazon and you don't know if the worker next to you is really a worker or if he's a gangster, that's going to kill you. If you say something and, and Jeff Bezos, it's known that he has these people hired and peppered like throughout, uh, the Amazon factories. Um, now at, at the time also, like, so he is, Derudi has formed a group, um, with Francisco Escaso, who I, uh, talk, uh, I already talked about. And also, uh, Oliver who, uh, Garcia Oliver, who, um, they sort of formed like the, the triad that was known as, uh, Los uh, Solidarios. Um, and this was sort of like Derudi's kind of primary anarchist group. Um, they're also like, um, with the Los Solidarios, um, they were also known as, uh, Los Justicarios, I think is how you pronounce it. I, I, I don't speak Spanish, but essentially, and this is the fun part, the three of them were known as the Avengers. <laughs> mm. Um, and when I was like, uh, when I was writing the, the screenplay, I was like, oh man, I know I'll call this the Avengers. Ah, shit. <laughs> so like. Los Solidarios, um, the Solidarity or the Avengers, I mean, uh, these were the people who came up with the plot against um, the uh, numerous figures, including um, the assassination of the Archbishop of Zaragoza. Now, it's also important to know that the Archbishop of Zaragoza was not just some random archbishop. Um, you know, he was known to uh, not only be like uh, involved in like prostitution uh, schemes, but he was also known to be one of the people directing a lot of political assassinations because at this point, political assassinations are going back and forth and back and forth. So, you know, it can sound really shocking when there's like, oh my God, you know, they killed an archbishop. 
But it's also important to remember that one, in Spain at this time, the church was not just the church. They were directly tied in with the state. And also the church was not of one mind. I mean, when Franco was there were there were priests and nuns that sided with the uh the the republic and franco massacred them um so really like the 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 church in this period is 100 percent a combatant um so derudi spends a number of years uh in and out of jail um they really have a hard time um kind of getting the charges to stick with him partially because he, sometimes he's captured in other countries and sometimes he's captured within Spain. Also that like there's a huge anarchist movement that is behind him and making sure to do the kind of jail support things that they need to keep him more or less out of trouble. Um, the, yeah. He, so this was what I was actually talking about. Um, the Vox Populi, uh, which was a, a publication at the time accused the archbishop of, uh, of patronizing gambling houses and being responsible for protecting the pistilleries, the pistel, pistella arrows. Those were the people who were killing workers left and right. Uh, and there were even rumors of his weekly orgies in a certain nun's covenant, which sounds to me like political propaganda, but you know, who knows? I wouldn't put it past him. Uh, he was truly one of the most hated people in Aragon. Ascaso uh, uh, felt that by eliminating him, they would put some order in the, in the bourgeoisie disorder that was currently sweeping the city. So, you know, once Derudi and them all are, and Escasso are um, arrested for this particular crime, um, there's a bunch of stuff coming out in the in the uh, in the press. But what's incredible is that the CNT is like 100% behind the people who are uh, taken in. And so the CNT union warned that even if one innocent worker is arrested, the authorities and no one else would bear responsibility for what might happen. And as for what might happen, you can see this is a very tense situation. Um, I mean, I read your screenplay and, mm -hmm. and I, it very much had a very Wild West character about it, um, even though this is not in the United States. It's in Spain. And even though it's, you know, it's got all this political stuff and all that. And you get the impression that there was a higher level of just kind of disorder in society during this time where it's like they can't arrest this guy because there's this union that's backing him up and they don't want the risk with that and that as much as there was brutal repression going on which you're describing uh there also was like resistance on such a higher level that 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 there was like pushback and one thing that also occurred to me which i think is interesting is it, it seemed i'm sure there were divisions among the spanish ruling class right that oh, that, that that this feudal hangover and the power of these bishops is something that a lot of capitalists probably didn't like either and that often especially these kind of clandestine organizations that engage in assassinations and you said were going on on both sides and you know you almost wonder if there were people within the ruling class who were kind of covertly protecting him also maybe they didn't agree with anarchism but they were hoping that he would lead to a situation that loosened the feudal restraints on society do you think that's possible at all i think that's definitely possible um abel paz has not gone in doesn't go into that uh in his biography but i you know the thing is is that actual like revolutions need money to function and they can't all be financed by bank robberies so um i think absolutely um now there was a situation that i i wanted to get into and this actually made it into my my screenplay um here uh, is that um, there was a raid after um, the archbishop was murdered. Uh, there was a raid ordered uh, in, on June 28th. Um, uh, it was ordered against other anarcho-syndicalist leaders on terrorism charges. Now, the alleged, the allegation of terrorism charges rested on a supposedly secret flyer that was distributed in the barracks, warning soldiers that their superiors were planning a coup and urging them to make common cause with the people. Now, we don't know if this flyer was real or not. Uh, that was the, the, the pretext for the police to go after the anarcho-syndicalist union leaders. However, what we do know is that this was actually happening. There was a coup being planned by Franco and Godet and a number of uh, officers within the, the Spanish military, and they were already talking back and forth with Hitler and Mussolini uh, 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 as to how they would take over this country. So it, it's amazing that um, the fascists 
or at least the, the, the people serving the fascists who are against the workers at this point, use the distribution of a flyer um, that essentially did rightly call them out for their plot as the pretext to lock up a number of uh, CNT anarcho-syndicalist union leaders. And this, this points to kind of what I was getting at before about the kind of Wild West nature of the society. Like mm -hmm. this guy is wanted for assassinating government officials and they can't arrest him. But then somebody puts up, oh, we, he handed out a leaflet. We got him. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it just shows that it's all just a matter of balance of forces. Right. That there were these anarchist unions. There were these left wing organizers and they had guns and they had support and they had strongholds. There were these, you know, forces that were with the state and with the ruling class, with the aristocracy, and they had their forces. And it was all just a matter of the balance of forces at the time, you know, who had the upper hand, right? And that yeah. that the legality was was kind of vanishing. And in a lot of the developing world, it's very much like that. You know what I mean? It, it's mm -hmm. like you hear, I've been to countries they say are so authoritarian, and I see blatant anti-government agitation going on very, very visibly. But then I also hear about somebody doing almost nothing and going to jail for it. And it's again, it's not really about what they did. It's not it's it's about the balance of forces at the time. And that's that's tends to be in societies where you don't have a strong legalistic tradition. It becomes more and more like might is right. You know, who has the most guns at this time? Who has the upper hand? Who's well connected enough? And it is much more like that. And that that just comes across here that the leaflet is not tolerable, but an assassin can't go to jail. You know, yeah, <laughs> it, it points to how how ridiculous. Uh, the rule of law can be in some cases. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it also like what's interesting here is that, you know, we have accusations in the United States that like certain forces within our government are working against others. Like, you know, the FBI is against Trump and maybe the CIA is for him, that kind of thing. Uh, and what's interesting is this did happen in a big way in Spain where um, there were essentially two major police forces. Uh, there were what were called the assault guards. Uh, their primary duty was essentially to be police officers in the cities. Um, and then there were also, uh, there was an, another police force um, that uh, was primarily like the, the police force in the country. The police force in the country was fascist. The assault guards were socialist. Mm -hmm. And so like when things got to the Spanish civil war with these people fighting each other. You had two different police forces, each trying to kill the other and also carrying out assassinations against each other, uh, each other's political leaders. Um, you know, there were times that like in a reprisal, like a, a fascist uh, politician might have a knock at his door. And he opens the door and boom, there's six assault guards being like, we got to take you down to the, to the station for questioning um, or the inverse happens. Uh, and it, it's, it's amazing to see a country kind of tear itself apart like that. And it really makes you think back to that, uh, Dali painting about the Spanish civil war that literally has the giant ripping itself apart. Mm. Like th that really very much is the feeling in Spain. But, but before we move on a little bit, what I wanted to tell bit, you about a little bit familiar though, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of, I, I really hope that you don't continue <laughs> on that road right now because in the United States, it's starting to seem that way. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just couldn't no. help interject. Absolutely. No, I, I think you're totally, uh, you know, you're totally right. And it is seeming like we are getting closer to that point. Um, I like to think that we're further away from it than it was in Spain, because you got to remember, like, the, we've been going through this in a very big way since the election of Donald Trump. I mean, there were stuff before it, but like you remember, like with Occupy, when the, the left was in the streets and Obama was like, there was violence, you know, yeah. the, a person got his head split by a, a gas cancer, but nobody died. There right. weren't killings and reprisal killings and people weren't carrying out suicide attacks against, uh, you know, protesters uh, or I guess legal suicide attacks. Is what I mean, like, you know, the people who m seem to be attacking, uh, this is all allegedly, I can't say for sure. We'll see, have it worked out in the court, but I'm talking about like Rittenhouse. Yeah. and stuff where they seem like they want to attack the protesters and then claim self-defense later. Uh, there was also the attack in, in Texas that was like that, but that, that never happened when we were in the street with Occupy. No. So, and, and this, and, and the level of violence that I'm talking about, like with, with this has been going on for like 10, 20 years at yeah. this point. So that I take a little bit of, um, yeah comfort from that. But I did want to bring this up because this is actually in my script. And I think if somebody reads my script about Daruti or when the comic book comes out, uh, reads the comic book, they might get to this point in the script and think, oh, Brent's just making that up. So I'm going to read this directly. So um, 
So the church pressed the federal government of Zaragoza authorities to apprehend the well-known anarchist Esteban uh, Eterio uh, Salomon. Uh, I just call him Esteban in the script. I have a guy named after him. He's got like four names. And uh, uh, Juliana Lopez uh, Miramar as accomplices to the crime. Unable to find the former, that would be Esteban, and unable to find Esteban, the police seized his mother instead, and the elderly woman, who was an elderly woman in her 70s. Authorities declared that they would hold her as hostage until her son turned himself in. They had yanked her out of bed when she was sick with tuberculosis. Twelve hours after the news of this outrageous detention broke, Esteban Salomero turned himself over to Zaragoza police. He said that he had, quote, nothing to fear from the law and demanded his mother's release. The police tried to coerce Salomero into confessing his complicity in the murder by beating his 70-year-old mother right in front of him. Yep. He was unable to endure this and signed a confession, although the police's tactics later became public knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And th that scene is in my script, but like, that's, that's the s society we're dealing with. This is what Derudi has been born into, uh, this kind of crumbling ruin of Spain. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Derudi spends these years evading the law, being kept out of, um, you know, the, the crosshairs of law enforcement in and out of jail, in and out of the military. Uh, there's one point when he has been captured and uh, they're going to deport him to the Canary Isles, um, which oddly enough had been another pl place that Franco had been stationed. Um, and what they wound up doing was this was after Derudi's daughter, uh, Colette had been born. They wrote like a note to Derudi's, um, uh, not wife, but uh, partner, um, uh, Emilian, like on his daughter's diaper mm. and passed it like from the ship to her. Um, but somehow, like each time they tried to keep him in prison, like it, it just would not stick. Mm -hmm. Um he wound up being uh, imprisoned in France for a little while. And Fran this is like sort of we're getting into more what I go over in my my movie about Derudi. Um, in that, you know, he, sp he stays in a French jail for quite some time. The French anarchist movement is really behind him being released. And the, the, the law says that you cannot hold a foreign national in prison for a, a foreign crime. Um, for more than 30 days. At this time, there is actually a steamship coming from Argentina. And what the French authorities intend to do is to transfer Derudi, Ascaso, and Oliver, all three of whom have been in prison for a month, um, to the ship, take them back to Argentina and execute them. Uh, because Derudi had gone essentially from Spain to uh, France, from France to the United States very briefly from uh, then he wound up in Cuba um, in Cuba. He and his uh, compatriots set about um, uh, carrying out reprisal attacks against bosses that were seen as being um, like particularly brutal towards mm -hmm. the, the people working under them. And Derudi left Cuba very frustrated and was had actually remarked that he couldn't believe how cowed the Cuban people were and that they would never revolt. <laughs> so I'm glad he was wrong on that subject. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to see how certain times, like how quickly conditions in countries can change. Um, Derudi left from Cuba and went to Mexico. Um, and one of the stories about his time in Mexico, um, which I really, really loved was, um, that he went to meet a friend downtown, uh, and he asked to meet the friend, like the nicest restaurant in town. And the guy goes to the restaurant and he's very uncomfortable. He sees Derudi in this like really super nice suit. Um, the remembering Derudi's passion for ridiculous disguises. <laughs> um, he comes up to him and he says, you know, I don't understand, you know, I'm an anarchist. I'm not comfortable among high society and in, in this restaurant. And Derudi's like, no, dude, I, I'm undercover. <laughs> like nobody's going to look for me here. Um, and they proceeded to have a conversation. And this, this guy at the time was, uh, he mentions to Derudi in this lunch 
that he's looking to start a, a school in Mexico, but he he needs money for it. And Daru's like, okay, you need money? Okay, okay, I'll tell you what, uh, meet me in a couple of days. And a few days later, he comes back and Daru hands him an envelope with 1,000 pesetos in, in it. And he's like, and he, he's like, this is what you needed, right? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, how did you get this? And he's like, oh, I robbed a textile factory. <laughs> So, I mean, like that was the kind of guy that Darudi was. He'd hear, hear that somebody needed something and just go out and, and, and do it for them. Um, and, you know, by extra legal means. But again, remember the time period. Remember exactly what's going on. Um, they wound up fleeing Spain and went to Argentina. Uh, the Argentinians, having heard of Darudi's uh, exploits, immediately made him like one of the most wanted people in the country. And... Uh, you know, put him on a boat, um, it, like it immediately, like went trying to execute him. And so he immediately had to leave, went back to France. That was where he was captured. So that's, what's important to understand about this Argentinian steamship that's coming to get him and Ascaso and Oliver. And, uh, their intent is to hand him over to the Argent Argentine authorities and the Argentine authorities are just going to execute all three of them. Um, this is uh, around the time, uh, perhaps a little after um, uh, in a, the Americans had uh, executed. Um, uh, what were the two? I'm, I'm Sacco and Vinzetti. Yeah, Sacco and Vinzetti. Yeah. Um, this was around the time. So anarchists were getting executed left and right uh, by authorities. Um, however, the steamship was late. And because the steamship was late and because the um, there, there was such a popular groundswell in France, Derudi was freed. Well, this, um, this was what year? Um, this was right before, the, I'm not sure the exact year, but this was right before the Spanish um, Civil War started. The right, Civil so, War started in 1936. Right, because I know France had the popular front government for a, for a while, right, in the mid-30s. Uh, they had elected a government that was the Socialist Party and the Communist Party aligned and, and briefly had an anti-fascist alliance with the Soviet Union. Um, so it would make sense that, that you know, if there was some popular Spanish figure who was known to be on the side of progressive forces, they might they might release him. You know, they, yeah. might, they, they might let him go. Um, you know, that, that might make sense at that time. I know Trotsky was given exile status in France for a little while. He lived in France for mm -hmm. a little while and eventually moved to Mexico. And, you know, you mentioned Mexico, and that, that's the interesting thing. At the time he went to Cuba, Cuba was this, you know, place where the people were not very awakened. But probably at that time, Mexico was probably a place full of activism and militancy coming out of the Mexican Revolution and all of that. And Trotsky mm -hmm. eventually moved to Mexico, too. That's where he was killed. Um, and that Mexico had this revolutionary tradition of big labor groups and big communist groups. And, and you know, there had been the, the Mexican Revolution that had involved landless peasants rising up and all of that. And so... You know, it's interesting how the revolutionary energy goes from one place to another place to another place. And that, that you know, give it 10 or 20 years, the energy in a place will completely change. It will just completely yeah. change. Um, well, it, it, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, France, be, also because France had had this culture um, of revolution, you know, going back to the French Revolution. You know, um, and a lot anarchism in a lot of ways grew out of the more radical currents of the French Revolution. I think that's where a lot of the th uh, of the major, even though aside from Pierre Joseph Proudhon, uh, a lot of the major anarchist thinkers were not French. I mean, there was Joseph de Jacques, but you know, like those are more obscure names known by the anarchists as opposed to like you know Peter Kropotkin was Russian, um, uh, Mikhail Bakunin. Um, forget where he was from. I don't think he was French. I know he died trying to lead a revolt in Lyon. Yeah. Um, well, there was, there were a number of like, I don't know if you want to call them like left communist or, or I, I guess ultra left or, or figures that Marx thought were too radical in France. Uh, there was Louis Auguste Blanqui uh, was mm -hmm. one of those figures. And he, apparently his followers were very key in the Paris commune. Um, there was Ferdinand LaSalle, um, and, and he was also quite a prominent figure and that there were a lot of like French revolutionary, you know, small C communists, uh, who did not like Karl Marx. There was the Paris commune of 1871, which Marx is considered to be the first dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, which was this, you know, this temporary seizure of power in Paris. Um, 
and that there was this whole you know network of cafes and and you know bookshops and such in france france paris was very much the center of like the revolutionary intelligentsia of europe up until the second world war i would say uh you know it was in in paris was where i mean and marx when he was in exile he was in exile in paris arguing with the left hegelians and that there was this whole culture in france of kind of tolerating the left as as part of a necessary part of society even people on the right kind of felt like well it was just part of their french identity to have revolutionaries and students mm -hmm. screaming revolution and such um yeah um which and, is why you know victor hugo publishes um yeah, like I, I think back to like um les miserables yeah you yeah. know and, and he, he publishes les miserables in france can you imagine like the reaction on like fox news if a story like Les Miserables was published here in the United States with like the, the themes that it has and the heroes that it has, like, well, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, um, if you look at that work, the way a lot of people understand that work th through the lens of the Broadway musical that came out in the 60s. Right. And that musical is very, very left. And it really emphasizes the student revolutionaries. And it really kind of shows the horrors of of post feudal France as being, you know, the results of, of capitalism. Um, but I think when Victor Hugo wrote it, he was coming at it from more of a Charles Dickens place where it was like he had to talk about the student revolutionaries because they were definitely an aspect of French society. You couldn't escape them. They had to have have a role in his his story. But he viewed them as kind of young and naive, um, you know, and it was like he was showing the horrors of prostitution. He was showing the horrors of the factories. He was going through French society and showing all these horrors. But it's like the way the novel ends, it's like the answer is to just be a good person and be religious and always do the mm -hmm. right thing. And the law, morality and the law don't walk hand in hand as the whole plot of the officer Javert chasing him around kind of shows. I don't think Victor Hugo meant it to be, you know, what the 1960s musical made it out to be. The 1960s musical was very much far left. And I mean, it, it was a critique of capitalism. I mean, Charles Dickens, I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, Scrooge, what is Scrooge? He's a, an evil capitalist who is screwing over uh, his tenants and, uh, throwing people out on the street in the middle of winter to freeze and won't give his workers Christmas day off. And then he's visited at night and shown about how, what an awful person he is. And then he changes his ways. You know, I mean, the, 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 these are kind of, you know, during the industrial revolution, there were a lot of stories like that, you know, bemoaning the horrors of the modern times. What's unique about that Victor Hugo novel is it does touch on revolutionaries, right? It does touch on revolutionaries and it shows them, but I don't think it's, he, I don't think Victor Hugo meant to show them in a completely positive light. It was kind of like this is an aspect of what you have when you have capitalism is you have rich middle class guys who want to form barricades and overthrow the old order. Um, I think that's what he was getting at. What do you think? Um, I think to a it, it does make sense. It's kind of tough. Like when you talk about big things like revolution, um, it, it, it puts people in a difficult position because, mm -hmm. you know, um, on one hand, there's these intolerable conditions that are happening, mm -hmm. but then on the other hand, it's how do you respond to that as an ethical individual who doesn't want to hurt anyone? And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked about this um, uh, when we were talking about um, homage to Catalonia with, with, with Bobby, he was talking about how just about everybody's social conditioning pushes them that they, they don't want to hurt anyone. And oftentimes, you know, it takes a lot of work for militaries to get people to actually shoot at a person as opposed to shooting above their head. Um, it's one of the things that I actually really like about people um, in that you, you kind of have to push a person into that situation unless they're like some kind of sociopath. Um, so when, when, when you talk about revolution and like revolutionary violence, like it, it's really important to, I guess, understand the socio-political context in which it takes place um, that really takes these people and uh, pushes them to this point. Um, yeah. You know, the Spanish upper class at the time was exceptionally cruel. Um, in fact, uh, the Lincoln Brigade, um, which were Americans who went over to fight for uh, the Spanish Republic um, on the side of uh, the communists and the anarchists um, and what you know, liberal centrists remained. Um, there were some uh, African American uh, nurses that came over, and they were shocked at the level of class hatred of, of the peasantry and of the uh, and of the working class that were displayed by the Spanish upper class. 
I mean, I've said this before, these, the Spanish upper class would literally hunt peasants on horseback and murder them. It was called Reforma Agregaria. And um, they literally said, they like, I have never seen this level of, of hatred that's not race-based, you know? Um, and uh, like the, one of the things that during the actual Spanish civil war, one of the things that like um, one of the fascist generals was quoted as saying was that um, what was wrong with Spain is modern plumbing because in spiritually better times we could count on disease to kill these vermin uh meaning the 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 peasants and the and the workers but you know they are because they're not dying enough from disease they're definitely getting infected by the disease of bolshevism and you know who can blame it you know rats carry the plague peasants carry marxism and and, and like that's the attitude that they had which is you know horrifying but you know you can see some people like you look at some of the QAnon memes that come out and some of like the really, really not so Trump people like there is among some of them, like a, a horniness to, to kill their fellow man because they think, uh, you know, they're, they're part of some other tribe. It's, it's horrifying and disgusting. Well, it's about reinforcing social hierarchy. I mean, that's, that's really the fascist goal, right? As much as they sometimes will, will demagogically condemn capitalism and talk about the working man or whatever, at the end of the day, they're about reinforcing social hierarchy. They're about keeping, you know, some kind of order in, in existence. And that's what they're about. And so they see that, you know, any, any inspiration of people to rise up and resist their conditions is, is like a cancer in society that needs to be rooted out. Um, it's interesting because the Latin American uh, countries you will get that kind of blatant classism often mixed in with racism among like, you know, like the cartoons that came out portraying Hugo Chavez like a monkey, you know, because yeah. he had some African heritage. Hugo Chavez wasn't that dark skinned, but because he had some African heritage, like, you know, the Venezuelan opposition would portray him as a monkey. You know, I mean, just, yeah, just stuff like that, that you don't, um, you know, you don't you don't see over here. Um, you know, I mean, you, you see it, but it's not as like upfront in your face. What I also thought was interesting is. Um, Harry Haywood, uh, who is the author of the book Black Bolshevik, who was a leader of the Communist Party, he fought in the Abraham Lincoln Brigades, but he was black. Um, and he talked about how, because he was black, in Spain he was viewed with high suspicion because Franco, a number of Franco's soldiers were black because Franco had been in North Africa. Mm -hmm. And, that, um, and that, that really kind of turned everything on its head. You said this group of black nurses who fought with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. They were, they were shocked at the level of, of bigotry and didn't see it as racially linked. And it was like the fascists had no problem having black divisions of fighters on their side. And so then, uh, unfortunately, there's even like some Spanish Civil War songs for the Republic that are kind of racist. Um, yeah. You know, and, and it was like they associated Africans with working for Franco. And, and so it's, it's all just confused. It shows how well, in different contexts, everything gets jumbled up. The racists and fascists want to tell you there's this eternal way. Whites are always like this. Blacks are always like this. That's not true. I mean, they're in different contexts. People act differently. Yeah. Well, no, you're totally right. And the, like, the thing is, is that um, the, Franco, I can see why they might have that attitude because Franco using his Moroccan troops, um, like, they would use rape as a weapon and rape at the hands of the Moroccan troops as a weapon. Um, famously, uh, like was painted on the side of like some barns and some warehouses were like uh, in, in towns that were more sympathetic to the Republic was like your chill, your women will give birth to fascists. Um, there was a lot of sexual violence uh, carried out by the fascists against um, uh, the women of Spain. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, in one town uh, in particular, uh, this is in Adam Hochschild's Spain in Our Hearts, um, they raped and murdered um, like all the women in the town, threw their bodies down a well, and then paraded around the town with their undergarments like strung off their um, uh, bayonets. Wow. Um, so like, yeah, these, these, these people were absolute monsters. And, mm -hmm. and this is one of the th things that I like about Daruti. Like we've been talking, this is like Daruti the bandit kind mm -hmm. of, we've been talking about for uh, a little over an hour now. Yeah, um, yeah. but like when you get into Daruti, the military leader, Daruti, the hero, um, we really see that, um, he's a man who saw this incredible darkness and his, a lot of people's reaction to that would be to just give up hope. Mm -hmm. But instead, what Daruti did was he looked at this and he said, um, you know, 
I, instead of giving up hope on, on humanity, uh, he chose to believe so strongly in the inherent goodness of humanity um, that he fought and killed and died for it. Um, and it's, it's one, it, it's contradictory, but it's contradictory in a very beautiful way, um, that, that I find, uh, you know, still kind of gets me right here <laughs> down through the ages. Now we've been at this for a little while, so I don't want to keep you too long. So what we could do is I could, uh, move into, uh, you know, the, the rest of Darudi's story. We could go for another 30 minutes and I could really speed up here, or we could do another stream later where I go a little more in depth. How do you feel well about it? Well, we can go for a little while longer. Why don't we do two parts? Uh, so we give this guy two, yeah. all the justice he deserves, right? I mean, I think you know, if you want to, if you want to finish it off for tonight, find a good place to stop, and then we'll uh, we'll do part two. Um, like that sounds good to me. Or the next yeah. night, yeah, yeah. I, I think two parts is a good thing. The, the book splits it into three essentially, but um, what I'll I'll tell you. So Darudi um, gets out of. Uh, um, he gets out of jail in Spain or I'm sorry, in France. And, um, he is, but he's basically told on his way out of jail, you got to get out of France. Like, so Darudi then, um, is looking around trying to figure out where to go next. Does he go back to Spain? Um, where he is very much a wanted man and they're going to be waiting for him at the border. Um, he was actually extended an official invitation, uh, by Joseph Stalin to come to uh, the USSR. Um, however, um, there were a number of problems. He actually did try to take Joseph Stalin up on that. He did try to go to the USSR, but there were like problems with his passport. And like, basically it got to a point where he got spooked, where I, I think he wasn't sure if it was a real invitation or if the Russians were mad at him for some reason, mm -hmm. or if there was just some bureaucrat that was like, no, you don't have your papers in order. We're not, you're, you, you can't go to Russia. Right. Um, what he wound up doing then was he met with uh, the famous anarchist Nestor Machno, who was also living in France, because as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, France was the uh, uh, part where, revolutionaries were very much tolerated for, for a long period of time. Nestor Machno had been the um, leader of the Black Army, uh, which had been allied with the Red Army. Uh, and then it, they'd entered into two alliances with the Red Army during the Russian Revolution. And then uh, that went south. Um, a number of Red Army leaders were, uh, or I'm sorry, a number of Black Army leaders were put into jail and Nestor Machno was forced to flee to France. Um, Machno is now in his forties. He was like, I think in his, she's like twenties, maybe early thirties when he was leading the black army. Um, and he met with Darudi and essentially told Darudi that, um, Spain was where the revolution, the world revolution would really begin that they had hoped that it would be, uh, the Ukraine. Um, and that this time it was not going to be strangled in its cradle. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible to me that like two of the most famous anarchist militant leaders like actually met each other and that yeah. how, how small and connected the world was becoming at this point uh, because of, I guess, the locomotive and the, the, the motor car and everything that somebody from the Ukraine could meet somebody like Darudi from from Spain. I mean, are you familiar too much with this period here? Do you have anything to throw well, in there? It's actually kind of not really surprising um, because, you know, these capitals in Europe, Vienna, uh, London, Paris, I mean, this is where revolutionaries went. Um, I mean, people are really surprised to know that, that Mussolini and Trotsky and Lenin had met uh, several times uh, prior mm -hmm. to the Russian Revolution and prior to Mussolini becoming a fascist because Mussolini was an Italian socialist and they were Russian socialists and they were in exile and they had met each other at gatherings and events, you know, and they ended up becoming, you know, bitter enemies. But they they had all known each other because it was a very small kind of network of, of and there were just certain places revolutionaries went to 
um, you know, certain cities and certain cafes and certain coffee shops and such. The other thing is that I think that anarchism, you know, nowadays anarchism is very, you know, I, I, maybe not as much as it once was, but, it, you know, anarchism was very trendy for a while. You know, I think mm -hmm. I remember anti-flag, the punk band, you know, and, the, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, calling yourself an anarchist was a very trendy thing. But at this time, you have to remember that the socialist parties were in the government everywhere. They were like the, the ruling parties in a lot of countries. Uh, the communist parties existed and were very, very big. But anarchism was kind of um, a smaller milieu, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that it was like, I mean, you describe him. He sounds like, you know, I, I don't mean this in a derogatory way. It's just a description. He sounds like what you might, what Marxists might call a left adventurist, right? He was doing exciting bold acts, you know, that would help the revolutionary movement. Not many people do that for obvious reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, um, and so the, the kind of people that did the kind of things that Machno and Derudi did was probably not a very big group of people. And that there were probably a lot of people in the communist parties and in the socialist parties who kind of liked them and were like fans. They mm -hmm. were officially in a different political group, but they would do some assassination or some robbery and they would kind of applaud. And it was kind of like that with the weathermen in the 1960s. Very few people actually became members of the weather underground, but there was this wide anti-war movement activist group. They'd hear that the weathermen had blown up some building and they would applaud and, you know, write on brother or something like that. And that, yeah. that tends to be how kind of, you know, forces like that tend to operate. You, you can't have a big organization if you're going to be doing things like that. Right. So these mm -hmm. kind of underground groups that are engaging in illegal activity, they tend to they tend and then they, they they tend to go for like it sounds like he had kind of a Bonnie and Clyde reputation. Right. I mean, he was political, unlike, yeah. you know, but but this is the age of the 1930s where in the United States you had pretty boy Floyd, uh, who was a mm -hmm. bank robber, who was like a household hero. You had Machine Gun Kelly and that, you know, when they would execute some bank robber, there'd be all kinds of people like, you know, crying for them because they killed bankers or something. Yeah, you know, it was like it was a period where people kind of admired, you know, it was the, it was the, the height of the social bandit, the Robin Hood. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was media was new. You had radio broadcasts and stuff. So somebody going around and fighting the authorities uh, in a very exciting, provocative way would really capture people's attention. Um, and I think that that so there probably weren't many people doing the kinds of things he did, even though there was a huge base of people that probably admired people who did things that he did. Um, and so that would make it. And then and then there were probably networks of safe houses he could hide at and things like that. It wouldn't surprise me if anarchists in exile, there probably weren't that many of them and they were able to meet. That's just kind of my perception of the era. I could be wrong. Yeah, no, I know. I know just what you mean. And like the thing is, is that, again, I, I kind of look at this because the world back then was so different than the world today. Uh, it, it does seem like we're, we're starting to teeter back towards that, as, as you pointed out. Um, but like, I very much see people like Derudi as being products of their time. Um, and definitely he was like one of the rare individuals who would actually go out and do this stuff. But also, you know, he beyond the the fun left adventurism things that he would do where, you know, sort of the exciting kind of uh, Derudi, the, um, you know, Derudi, the international Robin Hood. You know, you also have stuff like um, I mean, like here, for instance, if I can get this, here's Derudi speaking um, in Leon. Um, he was very much uh, heavily involved in the unions. Um, he often was known to remark, uh, like, even during the war, um, he would talk about how, like, the uh, like the spade and the pickaxe were just as important as the gun, um, and how the anarchists were not simply fighting for, like, hollow slogans, uh, but for conquest of the land, the bread, and culture. Like they very much um, were, th th there were two sides to the man um, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and like, we'll definitely get into that as we get further into Derudi the revolutionary. Um, because, and I think that really happens and he begins to get into the revolutionary character when he returns to, um, uh, to Spain. So I think what we'll probably do is we'll end this as part one All and right. uh, in the next couple of days, we'll do part two and we'll talk about like Derudi the revolutionary and um, really get into his conflict with the fascists, with the general Godade uh, and the defense of Barcelona uh, against the, the Spanish fascist military as they engage in the coup. Because, you know, as we established previously, like the, 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 the flyer, that they used to go after the anarchists was pointing out a plot that was real. 
at yeah. the time. Um, so do you have any thoughts before we before we we move on from the stream? No, it just sounds like a very exciting story. And I feel like we've been we've been setting up by getting kind of the scene tonight. We've been kind of setting the scene for for what's to come. You know, we've gotten an impression, an impression of who the man was, his reputation. We've gotten an impression for how brutal the society he was in was. And now I think the next live will get into the actual meat and bones of, of the adventure that you describe in your screenplay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, do you want to plug your pluggables for the audience? Where can people find you? Um, hey, I'm on YouTube, Caleb Moppin. <laughs> I got a new book out on Kamala Harris. You should buy it. Kamala Harris and the Future of America. Check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all. That's 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 it. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, you know. You know, yeah, and look him up. And I'll, I'll have your link in the description. I didn't, uh, I didn't link your YouTube channel. Um, sure. And uh, for me, please like, and subscribe. You're, you're on my YouTube channel right now. So you found me. Uh, I have a comic book, Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, which is nominated for two Ringo awards. Uh, we, the channel just passed a thousand subscribers. I'm really excited about that. And uh, I will be uh, either tonight or later tonight or tomorrow i'm going to be uh to celebrate passing a thousand subscribers i'm going to be reading um a poem by neil gaiman uh which i'm really really excited he's one of my favorite authors so um yeah lo look look forward to that all right so we're going to bring this to a close and uh thank you guys so much for coming out and listening to the first part of the story of buena ventura de rudy all right great <laughs>